The Russians have caused such intense damage to Ukraine's uh, inf- uh, to its electrical infrastructure, its energy infrastructure, that it's going to be a very terrible winter. Before we continue, we invite you to follow our channel, the only American show reporting live from Ukraine every day. I uh, am sure that uh, the other war in Ukraine uh, is still, of course, going on, and people are there also talking about this date, October 7th. Uh, what are you hearing? Let's go to Joseph Lindsley in Ukraine. Joe? Bob, good afternoon from Lviv. I arrived here by train uh, today, and, you know, here on October, you know, I was in Lviv on October 7th a year ago, and, you know, I think in many ways I was one of the first people to know, uh, or first Americans to know what was happening in Israel. I've spent a lot of time in Israel. And on that morning, that Saturday morning, I started to get text messages uh, quite early in the morning. We're in the same time, time zone as Israel here. And, uh, and, and from people, uh, including uh, people in the kibbutzes, uh, very close to, or, you know, where, where the Hamas was attacking. Uh, and so, and, and I remember many of those messages that day, uh, from people I know in Israel said, now we know what you all are going through in Ukraine. Uh, you know, they, 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 they realize, OK, this is exactly what you, you know, and with many differences, of course, but in intensity and violence, what Ukrainians uh, have been suffering through. And uh, just uh, after I arrived in the train today, I took a run through the park here in Lviv. Uh, you know, Lviv tends to be more peaceful and uh, the, the leaves are changing. And for, there's a cafe where the cooks were outside with a giant black cauldron uh, making this stew called bogrash and you could get a hearty spicy stew you could smell the aroma waf- wafting along the trail i almost stopped my run but i, I kept going hmm. and uh, just you know these nice moments of peace and i was thinking as i, I boarded the train early this morning in kiev about six o'clock in the morning and uh you know it'd been a sleepless night because there, and as it has been for several nights in a row uh the air, probably about five or six air raid alarms uh, and so, you know, you just, you know, you, you, you wake up and maybe one thirty, and then two fifteen, and three forty five, and you got to wake up and check and see, you know, it, what, what's happening. Is, is there a new attack? And, uh, and then, so I got in the train, I ate breakfast and I fell asleep without even drinking my coffee. And I woke up, um, several hours later. And as I was adjusting, I'm looking, you know, out the window at the green, you sort of ridiculously green fields, uh, of Western Ukraine. And I realized that almost it seemed that almost everyone in in the train carriage was was sleeping. And I you know I really realized you know everyone had gone through this uh, very sleepless night, uh, air, you know expecting attacks on the city. Uh, in the end, there there were some drones nearby, but there was no, I mean nothing really major in the city. But just realizing just how exhausted everyone is, I could just see it and feel it uh, there. And then I checked my phone, and I saw that two hours before. While I, while I had been sleeping on the train, Kiev was hit with three Russian uh, Kinzhal hypersonic missiles. And it does seem that air defense worked, but you know the sound of those missile, missiles, uh, because they are hypersonic, and when they clash with the, the air defense, that sound you know, shakes the entire city. Uh, so, you know, everyone from the elderly to school kids and everyone in between, uh, you know, it's a tough morning for those people in Kiev. And, you know, it is kind of nice to have that, these moments on the train, uh, to have a little bit of peace. And I, as I said to you last week, I, I could explain um, why I was in Kiev. I was at a secret conference uh, last week for security reasons. They had to keep it very much under wraps. It was called Brave One, and it, uh, as they called it informally, Defense Tech Valley. And it was an opportunity for some of the best innovators uh, in these past two and a half years in Ukraine to show what they've learned uh, from the battlefield uh, with drones and anti-drone technologies, even for example, robots that can uh, take the wounded soldiers uh, away from the from the trenches and and to some kind of field hospital, uh, and really incredible development of technology. And there were a lot of American investors uh, and investors from all over uh, Europe as well uh, who were there to you know because the the Ukrainians need they built a lot of this sort of on shoestring budgets, uh, and in fact there's there's some equipment that as I learned that. You know, Ukrainians could sell it for maybe fifty thousand dollars, where it would might cost you uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars in Europe or the U.S. Uh, a lot of it's out of necessity, but it also exposes, I think, some of the overspending in our uh, Western defense budgets. Uh, and so it was a very valuable uh, and insightful conference. And you know, I think uh, hopefully a lot of the Ukrainians who were there were able to make good connections with foreign investors. Uh, who and I think one goal was to get 
forward investors to to reassure them that uh, despite the constant threats, uh, you know, that the, the technology here is really developing at an incredible pace and it can be done in a way that can be protected. And so the fact that we all had this conference uh, for, for two days with a lot of key people, uh, that's why it was so secret. Mm. But it's a sign that this kind of stuff can continue uh, even amid these dire threats from Russia. Yes. And we're just getting a uh, word about Ukraine's military claiming it struck a major oil terminal uh, today in Crimea that provides fuel for Russia's war effort. Uh, President Zelensky has said that the, the war is now entering a key phase. Uh, wh- what does he mean by that, do you think, Joe? Well, I think as we look at the, you know, as the, as the weather gets chillier and everyone's anticipate, anticipating the winter, the Russians have caused, and I heard a lot of this talk at the conference last week, the Russians have caused such intense damage to Ukraine's, uh, inf- uh, to its electrical infrastructure, its energy infrastructure, that it's going to be a very terrible winter. And with just a few more attacks, the damage could be, you know, absolutely atrocious. For example, in a city like Kiev, where many people, most people live in high rises, uh, if you go for a long time without electricity, you know, like say several days, you can't get water above the third or fourth floor of the building because it can't be pumped. Hmm. Uh, so it becomes unlivable. And, and so this is, a, you know, and as we look at, you know, I saw the reports of uh, Haifa Israel being hit uh, from Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon yesterday. And, and, you know, how Israel is pretty well protected by air defense. Well, you know, you, Ukraine, I mean, right now the situation, uh, so that the policy of the White House, uh, especially toward Ukraine, is that there can be some kind of continued supply of air defense. But if, here's the concern for Ukrainians. If you step back, well, at one point, it's, it's, it's going to be a game of seeing can the Russians outlast that supply of air defense? Uh, because, you know, in order to, like, for, to protect Kiev this morning, it takes amazing resources like Patriot missiles and all this to to stop this uh, uh, onslaught from Russia. And as long as Ukrainians cannot strike the bases, you know, with these precision weapons from the UK or France and the US, if they can't strike the, the launch points, then the Russians forever, as long, you know, they can just keep hitting the cities. At one point, Ukraine's going to run out of air defense because there won't be the will to keep paying for that. And so that really is a concern. Uh, for Ukrainians, especially going into the winter. We'll pray for a mild Ukraine winter like Chicago's last year for you, Joseph. Thank you for the reporting. Thank you for introducing Ukraine on your social media pages. That's very important that much more people can get more information about the situation here and how everybody can help Ukraine to stay stronger and to save all the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, which side are you on? Come on now. Oh, which side are you on? Nachitis Toro.